this right here. Is a function. Yeah. When you close things in, it's like Yeah, and it seems so simple. And it's simple. It, it is a very basic thing. You put things in, and it comes out. And, uh, and there is one other thing about a function that's important to mention every time we talk about a definition of a function. Everything you put in has one. <coughs> yeah, one. Not two, not zero, but exactly one. Okay. So things go into this function and things come out. And we keep track of those things in several different ways. And we can, we can keep track of it by saying, if I put in two to this function, well, I'm going to write the thing that comes out the output right here. And I think, possibly put in two. So what do we get when we put in two? Negative nine, we got negative nine out, okay? But we can keep track of it in what's called an order pair, or we can put it on a graph. And this is what a graph does, it just keeps track of input and output. Um, and I know it doesn't seem like a terribly amazing thing, okay? But like I said, it can be a piece of a larger, more uh, interesting whole, all right? So, uh, we could go to negative nine, just as a quick example. But we don't have to just do that. That's what we did in 5.2. We just plugged in numbers and got numbers out and plotted those points. But now we can find, we can, we can be more accurate. Uh, for one, we can find some specific special points. What, what special points can we find now that we have all these? take a little more a little more knowledge than we have right now to, to be able to buy like by hand to find a maximum and a minimum. But we're getting there. Finding uh nine dots on the on the X. Okay, so we can find points on the X axis and those are pretty useful. We'll find them and I'll show you why at least in, in drawing a graph why they're useful. Um so how do we find those X intercepts or X axis? Well with the, uh, the two right there, we're gonna have to make uh, two at x plus one, two parentheses. Oh, okay. X plus one times x plus one, that's what we need when you square something, the whole thing by itself. Okay, so we're gonna have to make a negative one. Yeah, and then we need to just switch the, uh, the um, things around, plus and negatives. Wait, okay, well, that's getting a little short. Okay. Um, Why is that? You, so you're saying that this tells me, for some reason, this tells me negative one. What, what's the importance of negative? You gotta find the zero. You gotta, and you gotta, gotta make it all equal to zero. Mm, I think you're right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a break. Right. I'm gonna jade. Because negative one plus one is zero, and then zero times okay. anything else is zero. So because if I plug negative one in for x, negative one plus one is zero. Okay. Which is important because what I'm gonna do with this zero multiply it by this, and by this, and by this. And what happens when I multiply zero by all that stuff? It's zero, zero times anything is zero, right? So I know now, if negative one is put in, and zero comes out, okay, how else can I get zero to come out of this function? What can I put in to get zero out? Plus one. Plus one, if I put plus one here, then Anything that's going to cause any of these factors to be zero, because it's going to force me to multiply by zero, giving me a zero out of the output. And three, three in gives me a zero out. Negative one, one, zero, three, zero. And we already put in two and found that it gives us negative nine. Um, any other possible inputs that give us an output of zero? No, there's the function. This is the function. Uh, the one way to look at it is if, if it's factored out like this, the only way to get zero, since we're all multiplied together here, the only way is to have zero as one of your factors, right? These are the only factors. Uh, that's the only way to factor that polynomial, okay? That's part of the fundamental theorem of algebra. If you factor a polynomial, that's it. That's the only way to factor it. So here we have this uh, one comma zero and three comma zero, and in between, we've already put in two and found that we get negative nine. Now, 
uh, seems like the graph would then have to look something like this, right? So that's, that's a big chunk of the graph that we just found. But, but maybe like, could it come down here and go like this and, and go up there? No. Why not? Because that means it would be another point on the x axis. Another x intercept, and we, we've already found all the x intercepts. So it must come down through here. And so the point here is, between these two x intercepts, since this point's down below the x axis, then what, who can like finish that, that thought, that implication? Since this point that's between these two x-intercepts is below the x-axis. What's that? The minimum? The minimum the minimum. Not necessarily the minimum. Like maybe, maybe like what if we plug in 1.9 and that just happened to be like negative 9 point. You know, we can't be for sure that there's not a point below negative 9. But what what is something that we do though? And it has to do with not knowing that we're not going to come up here and come back down through the x-axis, but through, the, through this x-intercept. If this point is below the x-axis, what can we say about all the points between these two x-intercepts? They're, they're below the x-axis. They're what? They're below the x-axis. They're below the x-axis. Is that something we can say for sure? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Those, that's one of the things that I love about math is it's not going to make me a million dollars, and it's not going to uh, change the world. It's not going to cure cancer. But it's true, right? We always want to know things that are true. And that's something that when you can say, based on this and this and this and this, this last thing has to be absolutely true. I like when things are true, and that will always be true. And that's just a little tiny good feeling of trueness. Okay? Everything in between these two x-intercepts has to be below the x-axis. Because, well, this point's below the x-axis. These are the only two x-intercepts in this area. There's no way you can cross over the x-axis and get above the x-axis because we've already found all the x-intercepts. Actually, quite a lot is required to make that argument. But, uh, so, um, now in between here, let's let's see. Are we below the x-axis? Should should it actually kind of turn around and come back down? What's going on? Are we above or below the x-axis? Between these two, how do we find out? How do we find out if we're above or below? We uh, plug in zero for x. Zero. Now, could we plug in one half? Yeah. Negative could. one quarter. We could. Negative point nine nine nine. We could. So yeah. why do we pick zero? It's just easy. Yeah, it's simple. Plug in zero. It's well, maybe it's not the simplest thing to do, but it's simpler than all those other options. Okay. So we're gonna plug in zero. Here's what we're gonna do. Plug in zero for x. 0 plus 1 squared times 0 minus 1 times 0 minus 3. So you have 1 squared times negative 1 times negative 3. That gives us 3. 0, 3. Okay, so we know it goes through there. Now, like I said, I, I can't be sure that uh, it doesn't maybe go above that and come down like that. Maybe it does. It's just not really something I can say. I can't say that for sure might go above that and come down. But I do know, what I do know is all the points are above the x-axis between those two intercepts. Okay, um, now let's figure out what's gonna happen after I meet this x-intercept. Am I gonna go down here? Am I gonna have to go up here? How can we figure it out? Yep. Want to multiply uh, four x's up there to get x to four. What's fine, we'll blame it for about four. Um, yeah, if we multiply out all these parentheses, um, we may not know the whole thing, but it, it's kind of cool because if, if, we, uh, if we know what we're looking for, we don't have to do all that work. Because all we're trying to do is figure out, as I move this way, past this last time that y will be 0, where will we go? Where will it take us? Up here or down here? Well, if we multiply all these out, we should be able to see that these two multiply together, we're going to be an x squared. I'm going to multiply it by, as, as, as my first highest power, right? Other stuff, too. So I'm going to x squared and other stuff. And I'm going to multiply it by x minus 1. And then all that multiplied together, that's going to give me x cubed and other stuff. And I multiply these together, that's going to give me x to the fourth. It's 
going to give you x to the fourth and other stuff. And by that, I mean x to the fourth will be the highest power of x. Well, if that's the biggest term, like even something with x to the third we talked about, you know, Tyler talked about that, that drawing that I did uh, on the, you know, and I, I, I moved the values around and the bars went up and down and we found out it really doesn't matter. When x is really big, whatever the highest power of x is, that's going to be the biggest number. That other stuff is going to be so small that it, it really won't be affecting it. There's that biggest power of x. If we put in these really big values of x uh, in the negative direction, take it to the fourth power, that's going to make it be positive. And so this n, we're talking about this n behavior, it's going to go up. This, same thing over here when we put really big values of x in here. Uh, it really won't matter what all this other stuff winds up being. x to the fourth is the biggest term, so it must keep going. Clearly, got to keep going up. If, if it came back down and went to the x-axis again, we would have found an x or seven. So, so just keep going on being more and more positive as we put in bigger and bigger value x. Questions about that or about graphs in general? Or questions from the homework? Anything in general? Other than maximum. So let's review what's helpful in graphing these. One, finding zeros slash x-intercepts. Zeros and x-intercepts are almost exactly the same thing. Okay? Not exactly the same thing, but they're really, really close to being the same thing. Uh, two, finding points between the x-intercepts. End behavior is good to know. Mm -hmm. Connecting the points, of course. It's less helpful if not necessary. Okay, so they uh, let's let's see if they found the zeros and x-intercepts. See if we agree with that. Well, what should the x-intercepts of this graph be? Three y three. Okay, so if, if this is zero, I'm gonna get zero times zero times zero times whatever. It's gonna be zero. So three should give me a y of zero. Let's see. It does, right? This point is three for x, zero for y. Another one. Zero. It's almost. If this is zero as well, you're going to be multiplying by zero. So it's like, it, it escapes people sometimes, but if you set that factor equal to zero, solve for x, x will be zero. If you put in a zero for x, you should get a zero for y. Well, that part looks good. Um, let's see. What else? Can they have to decide what they did. We could just figure out what we should do. What's something we can do next? Okay. Behavior. 
figure out end behavior. Okay, so figure out we, you know when you go to the left, you go down, and you go up, and likewise for the right side. How can we figure that out? Uh, this x times that x. So multiply this together. Yeah. So that will be x minus three times x minus three times x minus three, right? Yeah. And multiply that by itself three times. Okay. Well, similar to before, if you multiply these out, do it, do it yourself. Do it, do it the long way. If if I'm not convincing you here, but if we multiply these together, we get x squared minus 6x plus 9. But really, that x squared is the one that matters when we're talking about end behavior. That's the biggest one. We're going to multiply this by x minus 3. Well, those two multiplied together are going to give us x to the third and a bunch of other stuff times x. And we distribute that x in here, we'll get x to the fourth and a bunch of other stuff. So what does that tell us about the end behavior? So to the left, we should have the end behavior going this way. To the right, well, it looks like the end behavior works out. Okay. Um, so we have the end behavior. So we've done this. We did this. We should do this. Find some points in between the x-intercepts. Well, we only have two x-intercepts, two and so there is only one between. So what value is between those two x intercepts? One is, and one's pretty small. One probably pretty easy to plug in. So we'll plug in one for x, one times one minus three cubed, one times negative two cubed, that's negative eight times one. So there you go. Well, there's the, there's the right graph. Is the wrong end behavior? Something wrong? Let me show you what it is. Um, there's this thing about just think about when you have the same factor multiple times. take theirs and do x times x minus 3 squared. Um, it's going to be really, really similar. Slightly different. All right. Our x-intercepts should still be 0 and 3. Let's look at our end behavior. Our end behavior is going to be different. And this is going to be a different degree. It's going to be x times x minus 3 times x minus 3. It could be x times x squared and minus 6x plus 9. But then when we multiply by x, we're going to get x cubed. We really just care about the degree of the mean coefficient here when we talk about end behavior. Um, if you need a refresher on end behavior, this, this video is about this. There's the lecture and then there's these videos uh, that pertain to the section of the book that talks about end behavior, uh, probably 5.2. 5.2. So if you go back and watch the videos from 5.2, talk about end behavior and go into a nice detailed explanation of why this is true. But if my degree is odd, my leading coefficient is positive, then I know that I have this end behavior. Something like that. So somehow I have to cross through these x-intercepts and have this end behavior, which means I can maybe go like this, or maybe I can go like this. <coughs> I'll figure it out. Let's plug 1 in there, just like we did in the previous one. Plug 1 in, 1 times 1 minus 3 squared, 1 times negative 2 squared. So notice what we have. We have 1 times negative 2 squared in the previous one. Since it was taken to the third, we had 1 times negative 2 to the third. So we took negative 2 to the third, and we got negative 8 here, this next one, taking negative 2 to an even power. So we're going to wind up getting uh, yeah, 
One times four. Four. So we get one comma four. Let's go like this. Come back up. So notice how it did not go through the x-axis, it didn't cross the x-axis here, right? It only touched the x-axis where? Did it only touch the x-axis? What, uh, what, uh, at what x value did it only touch the x-axis? At three. At three. And notice where we got that zero of three, from here. From this factor that was repeated, repeated twice, right? There's two of those factors. Turns out, notice when it was an even number of times, it only touched the x-axis. When it was an odd number of times, once we did it correctly, when it was an odd number of times, then it crossed the x-axis. So if we have an even number of repeated factors for that x-intercept, it'll only cross. Even if that's x minus 3 to the 4th, x minus 3 to the 6th, or if it's even, it'll only touch. But if it's an odd power up here, it'll go through the x-axis. So that's probably what happened to this guy. He thought, well, this is a repeated factor, so it'll have that thing where it just touches the x-axis, but it just didn't. Those kinds of things I don't really like because they're, what do they wind up doing? They wind up telling you this one little thing that uh, isn't all that much more helpful than just doing all of this stuff here. And it's really just trying to be a shortcut. To the point where you, you can digress into too many rules and memorization tricks and shortcuts and all that kind of stuff to where are. I just know how to take a function and turn it into a graph. I don't really get the connection. Um, that's what the, the answer could be. Well, just look the, the, that's the correct graph, and they didn't have it. So. Yeah. So throw a 112 in there, and uh, it could throw us for a real loop, or we could realize it doesn't make a lot of difference. If we first find the x-intercepts, well, what, what's an x-intercept? So what? Four eight negative one. How will we know if it's an x-intercept? What do you mean by that? If you plug in like negative four to the positive four, it will be equal to zero. So that will be, so if we plug a negative four in there, this will be zero, and so what will happen? Um. Just that being zero is not, not everything. What happens because this is zero? When you multiply it all together, the equation comes out zero. The output becomes zero. So if this is zero, or in other words, if this is negative four, then this is zero times this times this times this. It doesn't matter. We're just multiplying everything together. Whenever you multiply by zero, anything times zero is zero. So it doesn't change the x-intercepts really. Uh, negative eight, positive one. These these numbers, these values of x, give you a y of zero. If that one twelfth weren't there. We'd all be the same. We still have the same x intercepts. So what's this what is this one twelve doing? Let's see. Let's 
find some points between, between the x-intercepts. Well, what? We'll be plugging this between some x-intercepts. Negative two. Negative two, right there. Okay. Do we need to use negative two? Does it have to be negative two? No. 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 It could be anything. It could be zero. Negative one. Negative two. Negative three. Negative half. Positive one half. Okay. okay. But negative two would suggest it will be negative two. So how do we get it? We plug in a negative two. Negative two plus four times negative two plus eight times negative two minus one times times one twelve. So without that one twelve here, it's, it's kind of normal. We just plug it into these factors, we multiply them together, we get something. So the output is this, but then multiplied by one twelve. So when I take this number, whatever it is, and I multiply it by one twelve, I will compare. What it was before. So if you multiply number by one twelve, it comes out smaller. I know that's kind of a really broad question. It comes out smaller. Uh, it comes out smaller. So, so this output, which seems kind of normal, like just three factors multiplied together. When you multiply by 1 12th, now all the outputs that you would get from this are just smaller than 1 12th of what they were. So 1 12th times, uh, let's see, this is uh, 2, and this is 6, and this is negative 3. 2 times 6 times negative 3, negative 36. And what would negative 36 divided by 12 be? Negative 3. See, we didn't have that 1 12th. We didn't have this 1 12th. These three multiplied together, when you put in negative 2, would have been negative 36, quite a, a large magnitude. But then you divide it by 12, or multiply it by 1 12th, and now it's negative 3. It's a lot smaller. It's a lot closer to 0. Um, OK, so we did negative 2. How about negative uh, 5? One twelve, uh, negative five plus four, and negative five plus eight, negative five minus one, that's one twelve. So this is negative one, three, negative six. So this is positive eighteen. So eighteen over twelve. Negative two, negative three. Negative two, negative three. Negative five, positive three halves. So here's two, three halves. So it's, it's got to do something like uh, come through here and then come to the back. I'm going to draw too much because I want to. Also figure out does it go up through there? Or does it come back down like that? Um, so we could, uh, as Daniel suggested earlier, we could multiply all these out and, and use three and lean coefficient. That would work. Uh, or here's another option. Let's give another example. Why not do it an alternate way? We could plug in. 2, right? And if I plug in 2 and I get a positive number, I know it must go up this way. If I plug in 2 and I get a negative number, I know it must come down this way. We'll plug in 2. 1 
six and six. I know that it must go down. Um, any other questions? Let's do this last one that I have. Turning point. Why? Why do we call this a turning point? Turn. It turns from up to down. And here it turns from moving down to moving up. This this would be called increasing, going down to decreasing. All the values get bigger, and now they get smaller, and then they get bigger again. What kind of turning point is this? A local maximum. A local maximum. What, what, is, what do you mean by that? What does local mean? Well, it's the maximum for that good portion of it, but it's not right the absolute there. maximum for the entire graph. How come it's not the absolute maximum? Because you can see it going up past it. Because over here on this, you know, all of these values are bigger than that value. We're talking about the y value. All those y values are, are bigger than that one. So it's not absolutely the maximum, but at the starting point, that is the maximum. And this one? Local minimum. Local minimum. Because likewise, all these values are less than that one. Uh, so it's not the absolute, but it is the local minimum. And now all we have left to do is just, uh, just estimate where they are, OK? Where does it look like that one is? Here? Negative 0.5. Negative 0.5, comma. Negative 2.2. Sounds good to me. Negative 2.2. And uh, this guy. your homework in your groups and I'll come by and get them. And I'm going to give you the review packets and you can work in your groups on your